Returning to my analysis of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire, I'm going to start a series detailing events and theory crafting about the backstory, the events of decades past leading up to A Game of Thrones, including, among other things, topics like the Tawny of Hell and Hell, Robert's Rebellion, and the Tower of Joy. Today I'll be focusing on Ashara Dane, why she was at court, what she was doing at Hall, what happened after, and how she died. This is, of course, theory crafting on my part. I will quickly review what the novels have told us about this character. She had newly arrived at court just before the tourney of Harrenhal. She became a lady-in-waiting to Elia, princess of Dawn, wife to Rhaegar Targaryen. The description given to us in A Game of Thrones by Catelyn was that she was tall, fair, and had haunting violet eyes. Ashara's hair colour was not noteworthy in the A Game of Thrones description. In Barristan's chapters of A Dance of the Dragons, it is confirmed that it was dark, most likely brown. Any other colour would have been noteworthy. Daenerys' silver hair, for instance, is mentioned far more than her violet eyes. The same violet eyes that Ashara Dane has, according to Barristan Selmy. It is also worth noting that House Dane has previously provided a royal consort, Diana Dane, who married Maekar Targaryen, which was the father of Aegon V, or Egg, who's Master Aemon's brother. This Dane-Targaryen marriage followed a Martell-Targaryen marriage. That being Daeron II, also known as the Good, who married Mariah Martell to seal the peace with Dawn and integrate into the Seven Kingdoms. In recounting the events of the Tawny of Harrenhal, we draw our sources primarily from Bran's A Storm of Swords POV chapter, wherein the children of Howland Reed, Muir specifically, recounts the experience of her father Howland Reed, Ned Stark's friend, who was at the Tawny. In A Dance with the Dragons, Barristan's chapters also add insight into the events, especially focused on Ashara Dane. Howland Reed, after completing his pilgrimage to the Isle of Faces, came upon the tawny of Harrenhal. During the tawny, he saw a maid with laughing purple eyes, which is a shower, dance with a white sword, a red snake, and the Lord of Griffins, and lastly the quiet wolf, but only after the wild wolf spoke to her on behalf of a brother too shy to leave his bench. We are first introduced to the Ned Ashara romance by Catelyn in A Game of Thrones. It is later reinforced during Arya's chapters in A Storm of Swords when she speaks with Edric Dane. Edric, Lord of Starfall, nephew to Ashara, passes on second-hand information gotten from another aunt, Illyria, that Ned and Ashara fell in love at Harrenhal. And in A Dance of the Dragons, Barristan laments not winning the tourney at Harrenhal, in which he would have named Ashara the Queen of Love and Beauty, thinking he perhaps would have prevented the Robert's Rebellion from ever happening and he mentioned that some man dishonoured her at the tournament. Sometime after the tourney of Harrenhal, she is dismissed from, or released from, Elia Martell's service, and returns to Starfall. It is unclear of when, but is assumed before the sack of King's Landing, as she seems to have avoided the worst of it. Ashara was certainly at Starfall, in order to receive the Dane family sword, Dawn, from Eddard, when he returned after slaying Sir Arthur Dane at the Tower of Joy. Ashara's death came shortly thereafter when she flung herself from the Pale Stone Sword, one of the towers at Starfall, and fell into the sea. According to Baristan, who was unlikely to be there, she had a stillborn daughter, combined with the death of her brother, caused enough grief to make her commit suicide. Now, from Catelyn and Arya's chapters in the first three books, we are led to the conclusion that Ned had a dalliance with the Shower Dane. However, in Eddard's 15 chapters in A Game of Thrones, he never once thinks of or mentions a Shower Dane by name. The only time a Shower is even mentioned in his chapters is when Cersei throws the rumour of his indiscretion in his face. Catelyn thinks to herself that Ned must have loved John's mother, probably a Shower Dane in her mind, so much so since she could never get him to send John away, though we find out from Ned's own perspectives that the woman he did indeed love, with all his heart, was his sister Lyanna. A Song of Ice and Fire acts many ways like a mystery novel, with different plots and murders and other such schemes. It's often not revealed till later what really happened, and the first story we are given is rarely the truth. 
So, lo and behold, in A Dance with Dragons, when we get a perspective of Barbary Dustin through Theon, we find out that Brandon Stark, Eddard's older brother, was in fact a prolific womanizer, more than willing to go for what he wants, when he wants, and how he wants it. This especially ties back to his rather rampant outrage when he found out Rhaegar kidnapped Lyanna and went bowls to the wall, charging into King's Landing and demanding Rhaegar come out and surrender, getting himself killed doing so. Additionally, in Baristan's chapters, Baristan ruminates much on Asharadane and the predilection of young girls to focus on fiery tempered men. Mud would nourish you where fire would only consume you, but fools and children and young girls would choose fire every time. Jamie also remarks to Catelyn in A Clash of Kings that Brandon was more like him with blood in his veins instead of ice water, referring to Eddard. And later, Baristan reveals that after the tourney of Harrenhal, and his failure to crown Ashari as Queen of Love and Beauty, led to her choice to choose Stark over him, though he wasn't specific as to which Stark, allowing us to come to the conclusion that it was in fact Brandon rather than Eddard, and in fact it would have been an affair, since he was betrothed to Catelyn at this time. So at this point in the plot, we have evidence that Brandon Stark was in fact a secret womanizer, and Ashara could have quite plausibly had a secret tryst with Brandon at the Tawny of Harrenhal, and this neatly ties up the mystery of what happened there. However, I believe this is yet another red herring. When we look at Brandon's affair with Barbary Dustin, we should come to notice that Brandon is the future Lord of Winterfell and ruler of the North. Barbary Dustin, as his vassal, may in fact have aspirations to be his wife, and this is indeed confirmed by her later to Theon. This potentiality of social climbing for Barbary presents an after-the-fact justification for the tryst, perhaps hoping at some point to play on Brandon's apathy towards Catelyn in order to replace his southern bride with a northern lady. And since Lady Dustin is the first time we ever hear of Brandon's indiscretions, we must assume that Brandon is at least somewhat competent in keeping his affairs secret. As Bruce Bolton would say, a peaceful land, a quiet people, that has always been my rule. And in fact, then Barbary Risewell was able to wed Willem Dustin, the Lord of Barreton, who was killed at the Tower of Joy. In the south, however, at the Tawny of Harrenhal, he is merely one among many strong-willed, powerful men. And it is clear from the many rumours that are spread about Ned and Ashara that even the appearance of indiscretion will be trumpeted loud and far. Brandon has both family honour and a pending marriage alliance to the House Tully to think of, so he cannot afford to be seen being sexually promiscuous with another lady of near equal standing to Catelyn herself. It may be seen as normal by Westeros society for someone like Brandon to, to have sex with whores and tavern girls and servants, but an eligible bachelorette of high standing is another matter entirely. But what I worry about is what others might believe. You were alone with the prince, were you not? Yes. And no one else saw what happened between the two of you. If anyone else were to hear about this. I haven't told anyone. You told Sir Eric and Talia and now me. And though I believe you were not to blame, others might not be so trusting. They might think you were trying to besmirch the prince, or worse, that you're the sort of girl that might have enticed him in the first place. And Caesar's wife must be beyond reproach. And what a stain on Brandon's honour which would occur from having such an affair discovered would be nothing compared to how ruinous this would be for Shara Dane's reputation family honour, and her prospects for marriage in the future. And you've got to consider her position in court. Ashara is not merely a free agent, but she is handmaiden to Elia Martell. Any actions which Ashara takes, and any insult inflicted upon her, is also by extension inflicted upon House Martell. As a handmaid, she is under their protection. Through Elia's marriage to Prince Rhaegar, Ashara is also under his protection. Even if Ashara was willing to have sex with Brandon Stark, this would be considered statutory rape by Westerosi standards. It would be a stain on not merely Ashara's honour, but her family's honour, especially that of Sir Arthur Dane, her brother, also on Elia, 
who is not only on the protection of her brother, Oberon, but also Prince Rhaegar, there's three very powerful and very dangerous men who would have cause to shish kebab Brandon Stark if he so much as touched a hair on her head. Now at this point I anticipate a few obvious counter-arguments, so I'll address them here. So Arthur Dane is a member of the Kingsguard. As a member of the Kingsguard, he is supposed to forsake family and honour for duty entirely. Ashara Dane and Elia Martel are Dornish. The Dornish are known to be sexually liberated with far less cultural stigma to sexual acts out of wedlock. Agar Targaryen is looking to form a coalition against his father, thus may be inclined to overlook indiscretions between Brandon Stark and Ashara Dane for the purposes of getting the Stark assistance and by extension Tully and Baratheon assistance in a great council. And lastly, Brandon Stark has shown an inclination to ignore common sense in order to get what he wants. I'll discuss these in turn. Point one. A knight of the King's Guard is ideally someone who gives their life entirely in service of their king and no one else. At the tourney of Harrenhal, however, hosted by House Went, which was arranged through the King's Guard, Sir Oswell Went, the structure of the tourney is based around an incumbent Queen of Beauty, which is the daughter of Lord Went, who is defended by five champions from her own house, one of whom is in fact Sir Oswell Went himself of the King's Guard, who is taking a very ceremonial but very public display of family loyalty over duty to his king. We see that Arthur Dane, while loyal to Rhaegar, by definition of his vows, should place his loyalty to King Aerys first, in which he doesn't. Rhaegar lies beneath the ground. Why weren't you there to protect your prince? Our prince wanted us here. Based on this fact alone, I have to ask you, who is the better King's Guard? Sir Arthur Dane or Sir Meryn Trant? Sir Meryn Trant, who beats young girls at his king's command, who has possibly all manner of dark perversions about him, is, in fact, by definition, a better King's Guard than Sir Arthur Dane. He's not a better knight. He's not a better soldier. He's not a better battlefield commander. And he is, in fact, arguably not a better human being. But his one redeeming quality is his absolute loyalty to Joffrey, his king. One could argue that loyalty to Rhaegar is de facto loyalty to Ares, or loyalty to the future king rather than the current king. But one must ask themselves, is Sir Arthur Dayton's loyalty to Rhaegar purely out of friendship, or desire to see prophecy fulfilled? Or is in fact based on advancement for his own family? Don't get killed. Nor you, my friend. Oh, are we friends now? Of course we are. Just because I pay you for your services doesn't diminish our friendship. Enhances it, really. Like Sir Christian Cole of the Dance of the Dragons. Stay your hand. No, you were sworn to me! As your protector, my queen. Is he playing kingmaker in order to get a king which will grant his family honours and titles and advancement? How Stane, after all, were kings in Dawn before the Martells rose to power with the alliance with the Nymuras. Sir Loras of Tyrell was placed in the king's guard to protect Marjorie. Prince Lewin of House Martell was placed there with Elia, or perhaps Elia's mother when she was handmaiden to Queen Rhaella. Some King's Guard, like Barrows and Selmy, may live their life entirely for duty and service to their king, becoming so estranged from their family that they don't even know them anymore. But for others, of the great families of Westeros, a placement in the King's Guard is an opportunity for many things. A second son who stands to inherit nothing he doesn't seize for himself. And a dance with dragons, when Tyrion is talking with Illyrio Mopatis, he thinks to himself, Liar, thought Tyrion. There's something in this venture worth more to you than coin or castles. But he says out loud, You meet so few men who value friendship over gold these days. 
Thus, to Sir Arthur and House Dane, a shower serves a greater purpose than just simply herself. She has some part to play in the Game of Thrones. Thus, it is in his interest to protect his sister and her virtue, to maximise the value which she can provide for House Dane, even if he had no care for her whatsoever as an individual. As to the second point, we are presented quite often with this no true Dornishman fallacy, wherein old Dornishmen and women are these spear-wielding, passionate warrior lovers who have sex with anything and anyone that they so choose. And it is true that characters like Oberon, as well as his sand snakes, appear to exemplify this belief. Characters like Prince Lewin Martell having a famous paramour. Not all members of House Martell fit this mould so neatly. Prince Duran, the elder, who is afflicted by gout at his old age, is thought to be a man who puts his duty first. Sober, sensible, dutiful. And Prince Quintin is his father's son. Doran had one tumultuous marriage in his life, and Quintin has never engaged in a romantic relationship at all. Be it from just temperament or poor health, neither of these two seem to have much of an active sex life, and both place great value in fidelity and virtue. And even in Dawn, men still get territorial about their women. Oberon Martell himself had to fight a duel in his teenage years with the Lord of Ironwood, after he had slept with the Lord Ironwood's paramour. Sexual prowess seems to go hand in hand with his perceptions of manhood. I knew you couldn't finish. Craven! And Lady Nim, in the start of Feast of Crows, throws the fact that she was abed with the Fowler twins in Doran's face as a subtle jab that his own lack of sexual experience means he doesn't have the temperament in order to protect Dawn and properly avenge Oberon and Elia. Nor are all of Oberon's sand snakes alike in this manner. While Lady Nim and Tyene formed a clique with Ariane, Soella Sand, Oberon's daughter by a summer islander, was left out of this clique. And Soella Sand, as we should realise as Alois from the Citadel, despite coming from a union between Dawn and the Summer Islanders, two sex-positive cultures would likely require to keep her sexual urges in check in order to keep up her disguise as a man trying to enter the Citadel. Not all Dornish meet the stereotype. And in this case, I think Elia Martell fits the latter category better than the former. For starters, she is frail of health, a bit like Doran and she would tend to a K selection strategy over an R selection strategy, which is to say she would tend to marry monogamously and focus more on building the quality of the relationship rather than trying to have as many relationships as possible and as many children. In her case, this seems especially true as both her pregnancies turned out to be extremely taxing, the first putting her in bed for six months and the second nearly killing her. She cannot afford to have rampant sexual escapades and the risks of childbirth associated with it. Elia and Rhaegar Targaryen, the last dragon. My sister loved him. She bore his children, swaddled them, rocked them, fed them at her own breast. Elia wouldn't let the wet nurse touch them. And beautiful, noble Rhaegar Targaryen left her for another woman. The poor health and frailty would also mean less energy, less spare vigor in order to engage in the courtship process, and a weaker sex drive, like Duran and Quinton. And when you stop to think of it, and the, the ambitions of her mother, this unnamed Princess of Dawn, to secure a northern marriage, well, at least northern compared to Dawn marriage, for Elia, this princess would groom Elia in order to be a model of virtue, in order to, in order to remain above suspicion, so that she may be married to Rhaegar. This becomes even more evident since the Princess of Dawn, Elia and Doran and Oberyn's mother, was in fact a handmaiden to Queen Rhaella, who herself is quite a pious woman and quite indignant at Aeris's many indiscretions. With Elia's mother either taking after Queen Rhaella, or at least understanding the virtues she would be looking for in a woman she would marry to her son. And then one must consider that Dawn is not a homogenous ethnic group. It is in fact divided into three distinct ethnic groups. 
the sandy Dornish, the salty Dornish, and the stony Dornish. The sandy Dornish are those that dwell in the deep deserts. They have the darker skin, and as far as the Song of Ice and Fire plot go, we don't hear about too many of them. You can speculate that there's maybe some summer islander admixture in there, or they've just been there for thousands of years and developed darker skin complexion. The salty Dornish are those with the most Roynish blood. That was when the Roynish, under Queen Nymeria, came to Dorn after their exodus from Essos. They brought with them their egalitarian culture, which has shaped Dorn to a great degree. And then there were the Stony Dornish, those that tend to live in the mountains, and of which House Ironwood was one. In fact, House Ironwood was the hegemon of Dorn before the Roynish came. The greatest king of all, and Moors Martell, and the House Martell was actually relatively minor power in the region. Nymeria's emergence on the scene upset the balance of power, and eventually all of Dorn was conquered by the Rhoynish Martell alliance. In this case, House Dane is also a Stony Dornishman. These have the most Andor and First Men blood, and in the case of House Dane, probably something else, if the purple eyes, which are quite common to that group, are any indicator. This is going a long way to say that the Stony Dornish may also have a different outlook on life compared to the Saltish Dornishmen that live in the lowlands and rivers, retaining more of the Andal and First Men customs. How Stain does keep to the succession laws of the Roynish custom of equal inheritance in boys and girls, but not necessarily all aspects of Dornish culture. We do not know enough about Asharadane's temperament in order to gauge how likely she would take a risk with Brandon Stark. When in Dorne, do as the Dornish do, where elsewhere, do as they do elsewhere. In the core regions of Westeros, the Andal-rich regions, Ashara would be judged by Andal standards. As to the matter of Rhaegar potentially lending Asharadane out to Brandon Stark to win his favour, or at least turning a blind eye, this move would be incredibly short-sighted, and undermine much of the respect the Crown Prince has, not to mention the relationship he has with his best friend, Arthur Dane. King Aerys' many abuses of power and his madness have created enemies, such as his former hand, Tywin Lannister, who would very much like to see Rhaegar replace King Aerys on the throne. As you may recall from Tywin's backstory, Tywin's own father, Tytos, married Tywin's sister, Jenna, off to the second son of Walder Frey. Tytos, one of the Lord Paramounts of the Seven Kingdoms, married his only daughter off to the second son of a mid-rate lord. He did this, apparently, because he was eager to please his elders. This move brought next to no political gain for House Lannister. We see later that House Frey was more than happy to throw its support behind House Stark against House Lannister in spite of the marriage. And at the time, Tytos earned the scorn of many in his court for this action. Tywin himself, aged ten, ripped into his father Tytos and Walder Frey. There is another parallel story in A Clash of Kings. We get it in one of Arya's chapters, when she's captive at Harrenhal. She overhears the conversation of some of the mountain's men. So Gregor and his men, during a rainstorm, took shelter at an inn. After imbibing quite a bit of poor quality ale, Inch eventually discovered that the innkeeper was hiding his daughter away from them. After very little intimidation, the innkeeper brought his daughter, Layla, out to the mountain for inspection. After some pleading and declaring that his daughter wasn't a whore, the mountain paid the innkeeper some money and proceeded to violate Layla. After he was done with her, his men proceeded to take their turns as well. Sometime during the ordeal, Layla's brother, who had remained hidden during the affair, came out and tried to save her, and was killed in the process. Despite the risk to his own life, he made the attempt anyway. This is contrast against the father, who at the end of the affair was forced by Gregor to give change, because his daughter apparently wasn't worth that much. And after both his son had been killed and his daughter had been violated, he was only too eager to comply. The innkeeper casts a very pathetic figure. So just imagine if Rhaegar was eager and willing to hand out women under his protection as easily as Tytos or the innkeeper. In fact, in the world of Ice and Fire, after Rhaegar crowns Lyanna Queen of Love and Beauty, Simon Staunton, one of the king's sycophants, 
remarks to Ares that it may have been possible that Rhaegar was trying to win the Stark's favour by doing this action. If so, it backfired disastrously. Eddard, who is usually calm, was not too pleased at all. Robert, who was Lyanna's betrothed, put on a charming face, but underneath he grew angry and resentful of the prince. And Brandon Stark had to be restrained from attacking Prince Rhaegar in that very moment. And this was for a purely symbolic act. Now, perhaps if Brandon had had carnal relations with the Shardane, he may have perceived Rhaegar's act as a form of subtle retribution, because he would well understand what that gesture would mean. It isn't too hard to imagine him as a hypocrite in this matter, outraged by an abuse of power that he himself has committed. Duels and trials by combat and whole wars have been fought over the honour and respect of High Lord's daughters and sisters. No matter how kind or patient or forward-thinking or progressive or egalitarian Rhaegar may be, when playing the Game of Thrones, one cannot afford to appear weak, especially when one aspires to be king, nor so callous with the virtue of his servants. Within the feudal contract, a vassal outlines their responsibilities to the liege lord, but also does their liege lord outline their responsibilities to their vassal. When Catelyn took Brienne into her service, they swore vows to each other, copying that of which her husband Eddard gave many a time to men entering his service. The tall girl, keep in mind Ashara is also tall, knelt awkwardly, unsheathing Wenley's longsword and laid it at her feet. Then I am yours, my lady, your liege man, or whatever you would have me be. I will shield your back and keep your counsel and give my life for yours, if need be. I saw it by the old gods and the new. To which Catelyn replies, And I vow that you shall always have a place at my hearth, and meat and mead at my table, and I pledge to ask no service of you that might bring you into dishonour. I swear it by the old gods and the new. This is from Catelyn IV, A Clash of Kings. No service may be asked of a vassal which may bring them dishonour. Failure to keep this part of the vow means you forfeit the arrangement. And such vows bind the master as well as they do the servant. Should Rhaegar forsake this, being the man who dishonoured a shower dame, he would have lost the support of his friend Sir Arthur, as well as Tywin Lannis, and the many others who hold him in high regard. And it would have gained him little, as the men he was supposedly trying to woo would have seen him as weak and cowardly. And you can ask King Aenys the only how well being nice ended for him. All that being said, Rhaegar likely wasn't even present in order to take responsibility for this affront, as he was sent on a wild goose chase by King Aerys after the masked knight of the Laughing Tree, who he declared all of a sudden to be an enemy of the state. With Prince Rhaegar distracted, others could take advantage. And lastly, when it comes to Brandon Stark and his rampant sexual appetites, you should take into account that when he does lose control, it typically is when his beloved sister Lyanna is slighted or impinged upon in some way, as when she was kidnapped by Rhaegar, for instance. Otherwise, Brandon possesses a decent amount of self-control. Whilst Brandon is a womanizer, he doesn't have the reputation of one. And when Peter Baelish challenged him for Catelyn's hand, he didn't murder Littlefinger in a fit of overprotective rage, perhaps because he's not truly threatened by Peter Baelish, or perhaps because he doesn't care for Catelyn so deeply. All that being said, I still think Brandon had designs on the Shower Day. I just suppose that it wasn't a crime of passion, but a well-considered premeditated seduction. For you see, he set up his brother Eddard Stark to take the fall in case someone came to the conclusion that the Shardane had been intimate with a Stark. You may recall I mentioned Prince Oberon's duel with the Lord of Ironwood. Due to Oberon's young age, the duel was only fought to first blood. Given his high status, Oberon used that as an opportunity to assassinate the Lord of Ironwood by use of poison on his blade. I propose that similarly, Brandon was using Eddard, who was also underage, a ward of Lord Arryn, close personal friend to Lord Baratheon, child of Lord Stark and soon-to-be brother-in-law to the eldest daughter of Lord Tully. 
Due to his age and being the nexus of an alliance between four of the Lord's Paramount of the Seven Kingdoms, a duel to the death could be avoided by Rhaegar and Sir Arthur, since that would bring more trouble than it was worth, though honour would still be satisfied. If it was Brandon, an adult, who was already betrothed to Catelyn Tully, on the other hand, Brandon wouldn't have anywhere near as much protection. His own honour would have been sullied by the act of adultery, and he lacked Ned's relationships. This is all to say that Brandon may have made the calculation that Eddard could have survived being blamed for dishonouring a Saradain. Thus he is not necessarily so reckless as to get himself killed over something so stupid. Just a bit of a prick to his brother. And in fact, setting up his brother with a Saradain to dance would be quite disarming, I suppose, for her. In fact, Brandon's apparent generosity towards his younger brother may have in fact inspired Ashara Dane to think she'd seek Brandon Stark's protection. As Varys says in A Game of Thrones to Illyria Mapatis, this is no longer a game for two players, if it ever was. Stannis Baratheon and Lysa Arryn have fled beyond my reach, and whispers say they're gathering swords around them. The Knight of Flowers writes Highgarden, urging his Lord Father to send his sister to court. The girl is a maid of fourteen, sweet and beautiful and tractable, and Lord Renly and Sir Loras intend that Robert should bed her, wed her, and make her a new queen. I say this because Brandon Stark is not the only one who has designs on a shower Dane. Considered why a shower is at court in the first place. I mean, yes, it is commonplace for highborn ladies to apprentice under more distinguished and experienced ladies, so it doesn't immediately arouse suspicion. But consider the current state of affairs. For Elia Martell, her mistress, this is between her pregnancies when the touring of Harrenhal took place, and whilst the Meisters haven't declared yet, following Aegon's birth, that Elia would no longer be able to have any more children, an astute mind would realise that Elia's Overall poor health meant she may not survive long enough to become queen, if not from a difficult pregnancy, then from other means. And as a result, the position of future queen of the Seven Kingdoms becomes open and available again. Many on the sidelines, like Tywin Lannister, would welcome an opportunity to betroth Cersei to Rhaegar, and consider the step up as Shower Dane would have been already instantiated in Prince Rhaegar's household. A similar event occurred in the House of the Dragon and Fire and Blood, with Alicent Hightower being placed next to King Viserys, able to comfort him in his grief and thereby securing herself as his next queen. John Connington, in A Dance of the Dragons, thinks to himself that Princess Elia, no matter how kind and sweet, was never worthy of Rhaegar, due to her frailty and poor health, if nothing else. And, from the world of ice and fire, it seems that Rhaegar didn't have a hand in choosing his own wife. Either his mother, Queen Rhaella, was the dominant influence in the decision, or his father, King Aerys, as an attempt to potentially undermine his all-too-popular son. To find a princess consort who was unable to provide Rhaegar with strong heirs, thus preventing him from becoming a threat in the future, and whilst this may seem illogical on the surface, remember this is King Aerys we're talking about, he believed he would live forever, and a problematic child was something he didn't want getting in the way or overshadowing him. And by closing the door to Rhaegar's other opportunities, he prevented Tywin Lannister getting a foothold in the Targaryen household, disrupting the Rhaegar-Tywin Entente, which may have posed a threat to him in the future. This problem would be further reinforced by the fact that Dawn is, in terms of military strength, a paper tiger. While most believe it has an army capacity of about 50,000 soldiers, it's close to 15. It's the smallest armed forces in the Seven Kingdoms. Adapted well to defence in the mountains and deserts of Dawn, they tend to perform poorly on the plains. Their cavalry is too light to deal with the reaches, heavy cavalry, outside of their comfort zone which means they'd be of poor assistance if it came to helping Rhaegar overthrow his father in a civil war. And whilst this was a closely guarded secret of Dawn Martell, in fact you've got a character like Sir Arthur Dane of Dawn instantiating himself with Rhaegar as a friend, you have to let him know the state of the Dornish internal strength. But why would Sir Arthur want to do this, assuming he was the one doing this? Consider that House Dane is one of the oldest houses in Dawn. 
consider the name Dawn and the name of their family sword Dawn and the name of the house Dane. It may have been once that the Danes were rulers of all of Dawn. Maybe some language corruption over the millennia created some linguistic drift between Dane and Dawn. In any case, the Danes were once kings, past the Tolentine at least. Whilst Dawn was its own independent little kingdom away from the rest of the Seven Kingdoms, the Dornish, as a cultural unit, had a sort of solidarity against the other, the Greater Westeros. However, once Daron the Good brought Dawn into the fold, it did allow the Dornish to come into the Seven Kingdoms culturally at the same time. Without the external threat to unite them, the Dornish could return to their ancient historical divisions. Following the first Martell queen consort came a Dane who married a Targaryen king. And who's to say that history couldn't repeat itself? And who knows? The Danes could have plans for a reconquista of Dawn to push the Rhoynish out, at least perhaps with some, the support of the rest of Westeros. The combination of a weak, appealing ruler, as in Doran, and a firebrand, provocative younger brother, like Oberon, who, whilst feared, has a habit of pissing people off. Perhaps they appeared an opportunity to oust the Martells from power. So why don't we hear anything about this explicitly in the plot? I mean, I could draw parallels between Renly and Loras trying to marry Marjorie to Robert, but it's no guarantee of anything. Though consider at the tourney of Harren Hill, Rhaegar hadn't met Lyanna yet. He wasn't sure of her existence nor anything of her special quality that attracted him to her. If Rhaegar was at that moment looking for a new queen, and Elia was for whatever reason insufficient, Ashara would have been the likely candidate. Of course, Rhaegar couldn't just denounce his intentions. Setting aside Elia would come with consequences to his reputation, if not personal physical consequences from the Martells in general. And the presumed support he gets from Tywin Lannister is likely contingent on him marrying Cersei at some point, so he's got to leave his options open. Though in secret, they may have come to an understanding between Rhaegar and Sir Arthur Dane. We're not sure what Ashara thinks of this, but if Ashara was just a regular handmaiden without any royal aspirations, her choice of dance partners is a bit strange. As a handmaiden, besides being mentored by an older lady of the court, coming to court is a networking opportunity. Women can meet other women, just as Joanna Lannister and the Princess of Dawn met and arranged a possible marriage between their children. It's also a potential for the young ladies to meet men of status. The tourney is where noble men demonstrate their prowess in a somewhat tame representation of war. So, of the three men she danced with, besides Eddard, one is a member of the King's Guard, either her brother, or perhaps Oswell Went. I think it's unlikely that it's Barristan and Selmy, since he was also too shy to uh, approach her. But the King's Guard, nonetheless, takes no wife, therefore is not an eligible marriage prospect. The other two members is Oberon Martell and John Connington. Oberon Martell, though quite eligible from the outside, has shown no inclination to marriage. And the third dance partner, John Connington, Rhaegar's childhood friend, also has shown no inclination towards marriage. Possibly in his case, he has a romantic interest in Rhaegar himself, though this is speculation. Thus, to an insider, she chose, or was chosen by, three men to whom there was no possibility of a dalliance so that she could be shown off to the court and to the realm, but not paired with anyone who was a potential suitor. You see Prince Duran playing a similar game with his daughter Ariane, where she's only paired with men who are utterly unacceptable or utterly uninterested, thereby maintaining the appearance of finding her a husband, while making sure the candidates will never be chosen. Candidates like Renly Baratheon, homosexual, and Walter Frey, who's way too old. This is really Mr. Darcy levels of getting involved at a party. Now, a Shardain could have been naturally reclusive, having no interest in socialising beyond Rhaegar's immediate circle. Or perhaps she was purposely restricted to that. I bring out another parallel from A Dance of the Dragons, 
Consider the character of Alice Karstark, who ran away from her marriage to a cousin, and came to John at the Wall, informing him of the story of the time they met when she, they were children. At the age of six, she was commanded by her lord father, Rickard, to woo Rob Char, more specifically, in order to instantiate herself as the next Lady of Winterfell. I will definitely come back to this parallel, but for the moment, it's quite possible that Sir Arthur and the rest of House Dane was encouraging her strongly, Charm Rhaegar. So, Ashara has a great deal more to lose than just merely her virtue. Any scandal in which she's involved with will taint her reputation, thus disqualify her as a potential queen in the future. I think I'll stop there for now. That concludes the first half of the Ashara Dane video. Hope you enjoyed. We'll be back next time to wrap up who was actually responsible for dishonouring Ashara, what happened to her after the Tawny of Hell, and how she died. <laughs>